<laughs> yeah, okay. I'd like to welcome everybody to our genealogy class tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Melissa Barker. I'm the Houston County Archivist and Records Manager, and I'm also a professional genealogist. We've been doing our classes now going on probably two years, maybe three. And so it's just a free class that I do on my own time here at the library just to encourage everyone to do their family research and we work hard at it and we have fun too. But the way we do this is I give a presentation, a class, and then we break, we have lunch, we the friends at the library supply pizzas and drinks and then after that we're allowed to get on the computers out in, in the uh, library. So you can get on Ancestry.com if you want to or any other site. Um, all the copying tonight is free of charge courtesy of Friends of the Library. And so um, we just have a good time. And so every month it's a different topic. And so tonight is, I think it's a very interesting topic, but we'll get to that. I have some announcements. First I like to give everyone what's going on. So if you have your calendar or a piece of paper, there's some dates and some interesting things happening. On August the 29th, which is just Friday, the library is having their Artist of the Month. It is Catherine Adams. I think she does photography. I could be wrong on that. But it's from 4 to 6 p.m. here at the library. Um, so come out if you can and support that. Um, September the 6th, I'm very excited about September the 6th. At the library from 10 a.m. till noon, we will have Miss Manoa Uffelman who is an Austin P history professor. She and two or three other people that I can't remember their names have edited a book of diaries from Nanny Haskins Williams who was a Clarksville resident during the Civil War. And all her diaries are written from that time period, her first-hand account of what she saw. And her book has been published and we have her on September the 6th for a book signing. She will be here with books, selling books and signing from 10 a.m. till noon. It's a Saturday. And so um, come early because I have a feeling it's going to be packed. She's a local girl so she has a lot of family. So it'll be a lot of people here. Um, the next one is also very exciting for me. October the 3rd. Miss Ann Hagler is finally getting her book published about the murder of her ancestor that was right here on the corner in Erin. And her book signing is going to be at the Erin Methodist Church from 4 until 6 p.m. that evening. On, come on in. October the 3rd. We got chairs up here if you want to come up this way or you can sit back there. And as far as dates, things here at the library, that's what I've got. But the two book signings I'm very excited about. And she will have, Ann Hager will have books to sell and she will be signing that night as well. Um, let's see. Next thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand you out, um, this is, how many of you know about the Middle Tennessee Genealogical Society? Any of you? Any of you members? Okay, this just actually came into my email today, so I'm going to hand it out. This is their little newsletter, and it has events in it that you can attend and do. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Middle Tennessee Geological Society, you might uh, check into it. They're a great group of people. They always have something going on. Um, I was looking to see, if you look at the top section there, it is the Tennessee Ancestry Library event. This is actually going to be a very big event. And actually I went on to the link that they a link that I had in another email to where you could register and it showed how many tickets and things were still available and there were still like 400. But then when I went to their link to see what was available, it was all sold out. <laughs> So I'm not even sure that you can even get tickets now. But Ancestry.com is actually coming to Nashville and is holding a whole week, well a whole day, but also during the week, but that one day, uh, classes and seminars in Nashville at the Sheraton Hotel downtown. So I don't know if you can get tickets, you can try. Um, then they're going to have an annual all-day seminar November 22nd with Paula Stewart Warren. If, <coughs> Paula Stewart Warren is very well known in the genealogy community. 
as a whole, whole United States community. So she's going to have her a seminar there. Um, and then you can, you can keep reading and you'll see other things. But this is their little newsletter they send out. Um, I'm a member and so they do great things for the genealogy community. They're always having seminars and workshops and things like that. So if you would like to become a member, the membership are down at the bottom, I think. Or maybe get on their website and you can find out how much it is to be a member. $30. Is that what it says? $30. We have two members. Three. I'm a member. I'm a member. I'm a member. Yeah. Um, the other announcement that just came into my email actually today that I think I'm a little excited about. I haven't had a chance to check it out yet. It's been announced by Family Search. How many of us look at Family Search? It's the free website that we all like to go to. They have announced a collaboration with Genealogy Bank. Does anybody know what Genealogy Bank is? It's a newspaper paid, it's a paid newspaper website. Well, they are now partnering with Family Search. They will have obituaries from 1980 to 2014 available for free on Family Search. However, I believe it's just going to be like you click on it and it'll give you a little bit of like a uh, a transcription of information. It's not the actual obituary. I still think you'll have to go to the website to actually get the obituary, but it gives you some information. However, when you go there, it says that the database is browsable. And I clicked on that, and it kept turning and turning, and I never could get it to come up. So it's possible you can browse the newspapers. It just happened today. So people were probably flooding the website. So Family Search, Genealogy Bank, Obituaries. So that is good news. At least you can get some information and do some searching if you can. And then you can figure out you can go find the newspaper. So that was good news today. Um, that's all I have as far as announcements in the genealogy world. Put that away. Okay, tonight. Tonight our topic is managing your ancestors' history. And no surprise, I got this idea from watching Who Do You Think You Are? How many of us have been watching Who Do You Think You Are? Oh, that's good. What do y'all think of it so far? Good? I saw someone on Facebook comment that it was the uh, Who Do You Think You Are murder series. Because there's a lot of murders. Although it's very, been very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, I usually hand out or give you all some websites before we start, which we're fixing to. Uh, this time I decided, because you'll find out the method behind my madness with this, um, my top ten free, <coughs> free genealogy websites. So that's what I'm giving to you tonight. Oh, that's, it goes this way, more this way than this that way. And I need one. I need one. Okay. I'll go through these quickly. You can look at them more in depth later. It's a lot of these you probably recognize. The reason I'm into free right now is uh, my ancestry.com membership, and I've been a member for uh, probably as long as it's been online. Um, it came up for renewal. And when it came up for renewal, they had just changed the prices. I was getting a six month subscription for like $55 of just the US, not the world, just the US. And then gone up to $99 for a six month subscription. And I thought to myself, hmm, okay, I understand, but I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try an experiment. So I did not renew my subscription, and I'm seeing just what, I'm forcing myself to scour the internet to see what I can get for free. Because I've always had ancestry. So this is my experiment that I'm doing right now. Yes, ma'am. You're looking puzzled. $99 because they just took mine out. Mm-hmm. Was there? Are you sure? Because on the website it says 99 It was all kinds of announcements it was going to 99 for just the U.S. now and for six months. I've got a notice of the increase yes. on an annual basis. Mine's only 189 $189. Yeah. And I'll tell you something, if your setup were to automatically come out of your account, 
you will not be notified that it was coming out at the increased rate. It'll just come out. So you need to go into your Ancestry thing. If you do not want it, take out your credit card information or notify them you want to cancel. If you want it, get it. Yeah. If you don't want it. Right. I didn't get an announcement. So I went in and took it out myself. So. I've heard people say that you can get a discount on how much it is if you're an ARP member. Yes. I've heard that. Yes. Right. And I would encourage you to, that if you don't want to, you know, if you want to sub still subscribe, call them. See if they'll offer you a discount. Say, I'm fixing to leave and not renew. Maybe they'll offer you something. It's like any other thing else out there. They may want to keep your business, you know. So, but that was my thing. I decided I'm going to experiment and see because I've relied on Ancestry for so long. I want to see what else is out there. So, on my top 10 free genealogy websites, number one, I have Family Search. And I kind of have these in the order as I see them as important. Brenda, do you have all your paperwork? Okay. Is it just one? Okay. Yes, for now. Yeah. Um, family Search. Family Search is totally free. Now, some of their databases, if you click on it, it will take you to Ancestry or to Genealogy Bank or Fold3 or other places. But sometimes it will give you at least a little piece of information to go off of. Find a grave. Anybody not know what find a grave is? Oh, I have such a well-educated class. <laughs> find a grave is, I love find a grave. I put things on find a grave and I find things there. So I encourage you to read on any of these sites, read their terms and conditions, meaning telling you what you can and can't do on their website. But on find a grave, I encourage you to put your ancestors on there. Because you never know what I call, and in the genealogy world, it's called cousin bait. That sounds horrible. But you put stuff online, and if other people find it, they contact you, and then they say, hey, I'm related, and hey, I have more information. That's how we find people to help us. And we can share with them, they share with us. So Find a Grave is wonderful. It's, find a Grave is done by all volunteer. Um, there are people there that do it for all different kinds of reasons. Some people just will go to a cemetery, They'll photograph the whole cemetery and put it on there, each headstone. Yeah. And there's people like me that I just, right now, eventually I'd like to when I retire maybe do that. But right now, as I'm doing my genealogy, I'll add the people I'm researching onto there. And so that's a great site. Tennessee Electronic Library. Does everyone know what the Tennessee Electronic Library is? If you don't, raise your hand. Okay. This is an awesome website, and it's for Tennesseans. Okay. Um, on there you have Heritage Quest. The Heritage Quest is something that was along, it's still here, but it's Ancestry kind of overtook. Heritage Quest was kind of like Ancestry of their day. Heritage Quest, you can look at census records for free and get the actual images. Yes. Now Family Search, some of their census records, they take you to, to Ancestry. These, um, I did find the 1920, I think, census, they did, or 1940, they didn't have Fort Kentucky yet on there. So they may not have everything, but. Also on the Tennessee Electronic Library, they have Tennessee records. Tennessee, they partnered with Ancestry.com on this just for Tennesseans, okay? This will not work if you're living in Michigan. Um, you, you see the list of the records? When you click on it, it's going to take you to Ancestry.com, okay? But when you get on the TEL site, it asks you for the city you live in, your zip code, and your phone number to verify that you are a Tennessean. And I think they somehow can read your IP address and stuff because it's really weird how they know. <laughs> but so when you click on here, it takes you to Ancestry.com. However, they allow Tennesseans to look at these records for free. So it's free. Use it. The next one is US Gen Web. Has anybody ever heard of US Gen Web? It's been around for a long time. I love this one, especially if the people who are doing a particular website have really done a great job. This is all volunteer. If you go there, it has a website for every county, for every state in the United States, and even I think some other countries. So if you're doing research in a certain county, you can go here 
look on their website and see what information and links that they have. A lot of, a lot of places that are doing this, they have indexed tons of records, they put images, so go there. It is a wealth of information. Cindy's List. Have all of you heard of Cindy's List? Okay. Cindy's List has been around for a long time too. This is actually a person, Cindy, I can't think of her last name, Howell, H-O-W-E-L-L -L is her last name. She started out genealogy and she had run across, so, run across so many genealogy sites on the web she decided to start writing them down. And she kept writing them down and she kept writing. Well then she started uh, putting it on the internet on a little page. She's up to like thousands upon thousands upon thousands of links to genealogy websites. At the state level, at the federal level, government level, historical societies, genealogical societies, all in any kind of repositories you can think of. That's a great source to go there to check that out. I believe it's divided by subject, but it's also divided like in Tennessee, Tennessee sites and things like that. The next one is the Tennessee State Library and Archives. They have their own website. They have a section there called Research and Databases. You click there and go there. They have indexes for death certificates. They have indexes for the Confederate pension records for Tennessee. They have indexes, which they're working on this collection now. The Tennessee Supreme Court records. That's their big project they're working on right now. And so that's a very good site to go to. And so, yes, they just announced that their, their, their digitized Bible records are on there. Yes. And also on this website, if you're doing Tennessee research, this is very important. It has a section on there where you can go, look up whatever county you want to, and find out what records are available. What they have there at the, in Nashville at the TSLA on microfilm and in print form. And so they have a list that's there. And it's wonderful because it helps you before you go to see what they have. Number seven is Chronicling America. It's a free newspaper website that you get to see the actual newspaper. It is newspapers from across the country starting back in 1852 and it only goes up to 1922. They don't have a ton of Tennessee newspapers on there yet. They do have a lot of the Clarksville newspaper, old, old, old Clarksville newspapers. And you can do a search. It's searchable, but it isn't necessarily a wonderful search engine. So you may, I get on there and I just read page to page. It's, it's like going, doing the microfilm machine. But it's free. It's totally free. You can sit in your jammies at home and look. Uh, the next one is Macovia. Have anybody heard of Macovia? Yes. It's, it is fairly new to the genealogy world. It's only been out there for a few years. It's also contains a lot of databases that's searchable. Now they have a paid package that you can buy, but there's also free stuff that you can search and look at. The next one, last one, next one. Let me go to number 10 first and I'll come back to number nine. National Archives Database. This is the National Archives in Washington, D.C. They are continually indexing, um, scanning, putting up original documents. It's just a wealth of information at that website. I, all I can tell you is go there, check it out. Six hours later, you'll get up from your chair. <laughs> There's nothing else. But it's a wonderful website. Go, it's free. I'm going to go back now to Ancestry. I told you earlier about my experiment that I'm doing. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize when they have to get rid of their subscription if they do is if they put their family trees on Ancestry, they think they can no longer access them, and that's not true. All of my family trees are on Ancestry. And that's a personal decision. There are people, oh, I'll never put that on. Well, I put all mine on there because I want people to see it. I want people to contact me, and I want people to say, hey, I have more information I can share with you. Or can you share with me? Because I freely share everything. I don't feel like that mine is copyrighted. You know, it's freely to share because it's everyone's family. I feel, that's how I feel. You can feel how, you know, that's how I feel. But the family trees, you continue to get to do, even though you don't have a subscription. And so tonight, I'm supposed to have a computer set up at some point. I'm going to show you my, fam some, my family trees and how I do them to our lesson. But um, what you can't do is if you get a document off of Ancestry and it's attached to a tree, you can no longer see that. 
You can't do that. And you can't see other people's family trees if you don't have a subscription. But you can continue to do your family tree for free. Can, and it's, can you still get, sorry, I didn't make that. No, it's okay, no. You, can you still, by the library's free version, can you come here and get to your family yes. tree and then get to the documents that are attached? Or, that I haven't it? tried. I haven't tried that. We may try that tonight. Yes, I haven't tried that part. I would say maybe. Because the thing is, is that on the library version, that you're allowed to look at other people's family trees, yeah. but you cannot create your own family trees on the library version. So you may not be able to do that. I didn't think you could access the family trees. Yes. Mm -hmm. We found that out yeah. about a year ago, wasn't well, it? Exactly. By accident. <laughs> you have to kind of scroll down. It's at the very bottom over here. But yeah, you can. And that was fairly new about a year ago. It just popped up all of a sudden. Another thing you can get free on Ancestry is you can continue to look at the message boards from Roots Web. Ancestry took over the Roots Web message boards and you continue to look at those for free. You can post to them in anything. If you don't know what those are, it's um, they're message boards that are divided by every surname that's thinkable, every state, every county, all kinds of different subject matters. You can go there and there's people there posting, hey, do you have information on this? It's just like a community. And you can go in there and post about information, asking and looking for this. And it's still free on Ancestry even when you don't have a subscription. There's a little thing at the top that says collaboration. When you click on that, it'll be a drop down menu and you'll see message boards. And it's free still. Um, and the 1880 U.S. Census population. I think that will always be free on Ancestry. That particular census is free with images and everything. So those are my top ten free websites. Melissa, through the yes. Quest, you can also access books like on yes. Family Search and the Revolutionary War Records. Yes, yes. I, I kind of just I highlighted the census. I know we all are always looking for census records, but I hope you go to these websites and check them out. Um, there, you know, anywhere we can find information is always a good thing. And I hope you like my funny on the front this time. like to put something funny. I thought that was cute. Let everybody get theirs and we'll start. Managing your ancestors history. That sounds like such a daunting task. What I'd like, how I'd like to start this is not to pressure anyone, but I would love, I'm interested in knowing why you do your family genealogy. As I said, this particular teaching has, was inspired by the Who Do You Think You Are? And if you watch the Who Do You Think You Are programs, at the very beginning they kind of talk about why they want to find out what they want to find out. And so I really think, I got to thinking about it and I thought, you know, for us to do what we do, why do we do what we do? Do we know why we do what we do? Or do we just do it. <laughs> but if you have an idea of why, I'll just say I do it because I want to know where I came from, what my family was like. Of course, I do my husband's family too, so I want to know where he came from and what his family was like. But after that, I enjoy the stories. I enjoy knowing about people. I'm a people person. Today, I would sit down and I would talk to Pat and I'd say, Pat, tell me about yourself. I'm interested in people. Now, so some people that may be called nosy. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know every gory detail, but I'm always interested in people in their lives, why they do what they do, why do they do the work that they do. It has always interested me. Even before I got into genealogy, I was always interested in people. And so that's why I do genealogy. And so if you want to pass, just say pass. But I'm going to go around the room and just so you can tell me why you do genealogy. We're going to start with you. Well, we'll we'll all concede that we're all addicted, <laughs> and so hi, wake up. <laughs> Do you have any reason to 
any other reason other than what your wife said? Than what she said? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the uh, aspect of putting put, putting families together. Uh, I've learned that there have been some uh, siblings that I didn't know existed and cousins and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's good. Well, it's happened to tell you. Yeah. So naturally that spills on to my own thing. But I don't want to just know names and names and births and deaths. I want to know who they were. Right. You want to know the story. I want to know the story. That's right. I want to know. That's right. I need to know. We need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Priscilla? Well, I find that the past generation didn't talk about family. That's right. That's right. And I think that that's right. That's right. That's right. And that's hard to dig up it sometimes, isn't it? But it's interesting. It's interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And what's your name? My name's Barbara. Barbara, okay. Um, I live up north. I live actually here from Maine. Oh, okay. And um, my father's second, he lived in Japan. And his two sisters are actually from Digging, so I went with them. And we found out all kinds of good things. <laughs> um, but I also have people that live around town, and they, you know, we all have the same last name. Are we related? Are we related? Come to find out, 90% of us are related, whether they admit it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Houston County. <laughs> yeah, so that's how well, great, great. Deborah? Um, my mom's sister had a, a notebook, a old stenographer's notebook, that she got information from her father, who died in 1949. Mm -hmm. And I was always curious about the names in that. And that kind of started yeah. the whole ball of Is that stenographer's notebook from 1949? Sure, yeah. Ms. Susan? Um, I started uh, wanting to preserve some of the stories that my mother-in-law was telling me of health stories from her childhood. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it just snowballed. <laughs> Everything, yeah, it, we, yeah, we know the snowball <laughs> effect. <laughs> yeah. Yes? I think uh, mine is about the stories also. I've got some strange stories that were told and uh, name changes and such. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a challenge and I enjoy the challenge. Stuff that people who before me had started and passed away. Mm -hmm. I think I'm just taking up where they left off. I'm answering my daughter back there. <laughs> Brenda, I'm going to go back to Brenda back there. I started out young with my grandmother always saying, Everyone should know who they're kin to the good, the bad, and the <laughs> good, the bad, and the and ugly. Before that phrase became popular. <laughs> Uh, in the 70s, she started going with me to cemeteries, and I started writing stuff down, and, and it just really interested me. Wonderful. Donald? I think just knowing where, where we came from. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very popular. Miss Ann? Uh, basically, my aunt was into it, and I sort of got interested in this well, because she had to do a lot of legwork. Yeah, that's always nice. <laughs> yeah, there's like a thousand page book here on the Sykes family and I figured, oh good, I have it made. We're not in there. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Murphy's <laughs> Law of genealogy, yes. <laughs> Miss uh, Brenda? Um, I was always interested in history and you study in school about all the big events, the wars, the kings, the queens. And to me it's just interesting to see it on a more individual perspective on history. Like just ordinary people with their lives. And of course, just the solving the puzzle. Being oh, yes. Being the pieces together. Yes. Yes, Miss Helen. Um, I have a cousin who's in, always been into genealogy and got me interested in it on that one family line, but I really had no other information further back than two generations mm -hmm. on any of my <coughs> other lines. And I really, really, really wanted to be in the DAR because I went to a DAR school when I was. I grew okay. up and graduated from a DAR school, so I wanted to be in the DAR, so I thought, I, didn't have, I wasn't very optimistic that there'd be any information out there, but Susan can tell you there is. Yes, Helen thinks that all you do is sit at the computer and they fall out of the sky, <laughs> and, that, and that's the way it has worked for her. Oh, so wow, I'm, wow. I'm up to seven Patriots yeah. now. So. Wow, yeah. man. Seven, oh, wow. in a oh, year and a half, oh, so yeah. Oh. Miss so, Barbara? I wanted to do it for my kids. For your kids? Yeah. yeah, I've heard a lot of people say that. 
young kids are not in a restaurant seat I know. right now. Not now. <laughs> yes, I know. So, yeah. 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 Miss Pat. And, I, and I'm interested in it for all of the reasons that they gave. <laughs> plus, plus I, mean, I taught history for yes, many, did. many years, and that was one of the things, but that was what my daddy instilled in me. Yeah. And if anybody who knew him, he was a great storyteller. He knew everybody who was related to anybody, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, and, and we started going mm -hmm. back. Started yeah. going back that way. It's great. And, and then he would... He went to many of, there's a book called History of Houston County mm -hmm. by Iris Hopkins mm -hmm. Plank, who's a cousin. Mm -hmm. And he and my double first cousin mm -hmm. helped her walk the cemeteries and get a lot of the different things, and then he would bring back a lot of that information. Mm -hmm. You know, and talk about it. Right. And, um, yeah. Well, I've told the story in the past about how I actually got into genealogy. Um, I didn't, and I wish that I had sooner because there's people that have passed on that I would really like to talk to. But we went to one of my husband's uh, family member's funeral. All my husband is, all of his family is from right here in Houston County. And so we went to a funeral and there was a lady there that was walking around talking to all everybody that was there and she had this spiral notebook and she was writing and, this, and I thought, what is she doing? <laughs> and what a funeral. You know, I'm like, what are you, it was a visitation, it wasn't the actual funeral, it was a visitation. I said, what is she doing? And so I went up to her and I said, can I ask what you're doing? And she had this file notebook, it was about that thick, and it was full of family information. And so that night I said, can I take this home and copy it? I'll bring it back tomorrow. <laughs> I'm thinking, I just thought it was interesting. So I copied it and that's what started me. I started looking at what she had and, and it, like I said, it's a snowball. It just, and then it becomes an addiction and an obsession and you keep going. So we all have our reasons, maybe there's the same, but we have reasons why we do this. And I mentioned this statistic before. A lot of us talked about stories. It only takes two generations to lose all the family stories because they're not retold. They're not saved. They're not managed like we're going to talk about tonight. So I asked that. Why do we do genealogy? What do you hope to accomplish? I'm not going to ask everyone this. I just want you to think about it. Now, I've heard some people say, well, okay, I'm done. I've done my genealogy, now I'm done. Is anybody in this room done? <laughs> I've actually heard people say that, I'm done. Oh boy, how did you get done? <laughs> so, you know, we have goals, we have accomplishments, we have ancestors that we want to find this piece of information, we want to find out, we want to find a, an ancestor that we've been searching for. So we have goals that we want to, you know, reach. Um, and think about what form you would like your ancestor's story to be told. Believe it or not, there's more than one way to do that. We don't have to write a book. I think we all get, kind of get stymied in that thing that we've got to write a book. Well, you don't have to write a book. There's other ways to make your story of your ancestors in such a way that you can pass it on to generations to come. And it's not write a book. And so we're going to talk about some of those ways tonight. Um, collecting your ancestors' information and records. We're all doing this. And I, another reason why I brought this up is because every time we have a class, which is not as much tonight, although Miss Deborah, you kind of win, people would come with their stacks of stuff, their papers and their research and their this and their that. And I have several people ask me, how do I organize this? How do I, you know, what do I do with all this? So we'll touch a little bit on that. I usually have an organization class in January when we talk big about organizing. So I'll just touch on it. <laughs> um, we all collect information about our ancestors as part of our genealogy process. Whether we collect paper records or electronic records or both, we still search out the information contained in them to help us tell our ancestor's story. How we manage the information and records we collect is important in managing our ancestor's story. Now this particular part I found interesting. How do you collect your ancestors' information? Now I put the definition of the word manage. Now the first definition is to be in charge. Well I would have to say that we're pretty much all in charge of our genealogy research. The second one I really like. Succeed in surviving or in attaining one's aims, especially against heavy odds, <laughs> to cope. I have days when I cope with my genealogy research. 
So yes, and we all have those times we're up against a heavy odds, a brick wall, whatever you want to call it. So hopefully tonight we can give you some tips and helps on taking care of that. How well do you pay attention or analyze the information contained in the records you collect? Now, I also know that while we all have different reasons for what we do, we all have different ways of researching and we have different um, what we collect is different for each of us. I know people that just collect names and that's fine. If that's what they want to do, they just collect names. They have a huge database and they're proud of their database and that's wonderful. That's what they do. I have people that collect birth dates, death dates, marriage dates, and that's it. That's all they want. That's all they're interested in. And then I have those that want to know the story. They want to know what was my ancestor's hobby? What did they eat for breakfast? You know, those, that's me. That's, that's the kind of person I am. And that's a frustrating person to be because that stuff is not in records. <laughs> but that's what I want to know. I want to know everything I can find about my ancestor and their cousin and their uncle's cousin. And I research everything and everybody. So, But that's okay. However you do it, however you decide to do it, that's fine. The main thing is that when you get a document, and I don't say in here, I pick it up. Let's say a death certificate. Do you just go, okay, that's the death certificate. There's the death date. This is where they died. Oh, that's what he died of. File it away. Bye, Jerry. Bye, buddy. See ya. Do you just file it away? There's a lot more information on that record and a lot more information that you can take that record and go find somewhere else. So if you're the type of person that does more than just the dates, if you want to know it all, pay attention to your records. Read every single thing that is on that record. And I'll tell you what I do. You don't have to do this. I'm more obsessed. I, trans I, translate. I transcribe every document, every word. Even if it's a death certificate that, from the same state that I've transcribed 20 times, I still transcribe it word for word. Because for me, as I'm typing, I'm learning and seeing things that I would never get if I just looked at the piece of paper. That's me. Now somebody else, they have a photogenic, they can look at a piece of paper and that, they can just see it and they know everything that's on That's wonderful. I wish I had that. I don't. So I take the time in my family program and I transcribe it. I know, pass on the sugar. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> we know but it helps me to look at all the information. Also, when you're looking at the information, ask yourself questions. Like on a death certificate, it has the informant. Does everyone know pretty much on a death certificate there's always an informant? Do you know what an informant is? Okay, if it's not a family member, if it's someone else, who is that? That could be a piece of your puzzle. So yeah, I would go and I'd look this person up, figure out who they are and why were they the informant. And maybe they were the doctor, they were the nurse, they were maybe somebody insignificant. <coughs> but maybe they were someone significant and I'd just look over it and go on. A witness on a marriage record. If it's not a family member, or if it is a family member but it's got a different last name and you don't recognize it as a family member, you'll never know unless you check into it or even ask the question. So look at all your documents, analyze them, become a detective. I consider all of us detectives anyway. I love detective shows. Because it helps me with thinking about how to look at my research. So analyze your records a little better than maybe that you do. It might, you might be surprised. Organizing your ancestors' history. Here's that little piece about organizing. In order for us to tell our ancestors' story, we have to get our research in order and organize. It is difficult to tell your ancestors' story if you have papers, documents, and computer files all over the place and in piles. Oh, we have piles. We have piles. We have drawers full. And, you know, I have a closet. I have a genealogy. I have an office, but I have a genealogy closet where all my genealogy stuff goes. And, no, it's not organized. I'll tell you, it's not. I do my best. But it's these help. <laughs> well, 
While it could be a large task to get organized, as genealogists we should try to do our best. What organizational methods do you use to help you with your genealogy? Um, we all have our ways, and like I say, I talk about this in our organization class, of how we organize our genealogy. Some people use a three ring binder method. Um, I did do that. I am now in the process of a very, very slowly transforming from a three ring binder to a file folder method. And that is, I've explained it, but there's new people here, I'll do it real fast. File folder method from, is where I take, each ancestor has their own file folder. And I put all their documents and information in there chronologically. And it goes in a filing cabinet. I don't do the color coding like some people do. I can't, I can't, I don't understand color coding. It will not get in my brain. So I just do it alphabetically. And then like, let's say the Sanders surname, if I have my Sanders people, they're in there, not alphabetically, but by the oldest to the youngest, like the patriarch, and then go back that way. That's how I do it. Find what works for you. Don't do it my way. Don't do it Pat's way. Don't do what you can do. Because if you're going to do someone else's and you don't like it, you're not going to do it. So find whatever works for you, but do it consistently. That's the main thing. Do it consistently and just do it. <laughs> I mean, we love our piles, but you know, if you go someplace and you don't know if you have a document and you buy it again, because a lot of these places are charging for copies and you have to right away and order them, and you get it in and then one day you're going through a pile and you go, oh wait, there it is. I bought it again. I've done that. I've done that. There's no, you know, I admit it, I've done that. So if you know what you have, not only can you use the information for your research, but you won't spend the money to get it again. Doing a little at a time can add up to getting the job done. Don't walk into wherever it is, your piles or whatever you've got, and think you have to do it all now in an hour. That You will never do it that way. Take a pile, you know, 10, 20 pages, and take however long it takes and organize that and be done. The next day, next week, whenever you do it again, take another pile and do it again. Same way on the computer. How many of us, our computers are not even organized when it comes to files if you use computers? Because you're on Ancestry, you're on Family Search, and you see things, and you save it, and you put it on your computer, and you put it on constantly. So then you have all this stuff, just like piles on your floor. It's piles on your computer. They need to be organized, too, because you don't know what you got. So try to do that, too. I'm awful at the computer organizing part. I'm much better at paper than I am. Yeah. Put things in folders on the computer a lot easier. Do you? Yeah. You're more computer person. I'm more paper person. So. Yes, you can. And another thing that I did not put in here that I will address, a lot of people are trying to get away, they're trying to go paperless. And I understand that, and that's great. I'm a paper person. It's like I'm a book person. I'm not a Kindle person. You are who you are. But if you decide to scan everything, I would encourage you not to throw everything away, but you know, try to organize. But if you scan everything, that's great. Um, if you do, don't leave it on your computer. Use a backup of some kind. Um, if you decide to put it on CD, that's great. But one day CDs are going to deteriorate too. Put it on a form, which I can, a flash drive to me right now is the best form. Right. Make five copies. Put one in a safety deposit box or in a safe at home. Give away to your family members that you trust or a friend or someone. Give them a copy. That way if something happens, you can go get it. It's there. Your computer's crashed. You've lost everything. Wait a minute. Aunt Martha's got my flash drive. Right. And you can recover it. And, and you know, one of the reasons that I talk about doing a lot of things digitally, I mean, yes, I, you know, I bet I am, you know, more mm -hmm. familiar with a lot of that. But I look at my children, mm -hmm. my grandchildren, and I say, are they going to, you know, which way are they going to want it? Or are they, are they going to toss it all? Or mm -hmm. are they going to, you know, are they going right. to be able to use it and add to it and do different things? And I just think that having it, you know, digitized in a media yes. would be easier as opposed to going and picking up arms full of, yes. of other yes. things. By taking, you know, that, the, the arms full of, of papers will most likely end up in the dumpster than a flash drive, probably. Absolutely. 
it's and it's to copy and yes, and yes. It's, yes. And it's their it's this their is medium. Their it's, medium. It's their this medium. Is, this that's is the right. Thing that they're more familiar yes, with. Yes, that's right. And I would also add on that line talking about children, families when you're gone or whatever. Um, as an archivist as well, I see so many families when their loved ones pass that they go into that house. And I understand the thinking. They want to get through this. They want to get done. It's hurtful. And so they just throw everything away. You know. Leave some kind of something with your family telling them where you want your genealogy to go. And hope that they do it. But, you know, if you want it to be donated to a library, to an archive, to wherever these people were from, that would be the most preferable. Because like me as an archivist, I'm not going to want, you know, a family from Michigan that has never been here stuff. Although I might take it and try to find an archives in Michigan to send it to. But that's how we're going to save things. Um, since we became an archives four years ago, I've heard more stories of people throwing things away than of saving them. Put it in your wheel, then they're stuck with it. Absolutely. <laughs> so I encourage you to make those plans now. I mean, hopefully, yeah, we're, you know, nothing's going to happen, but if it does, then maybe, you know, make plans now. And it's, it's, you know, I know some of us have mountains and mountains. And you know, and we may not have any children or grandchildren that are even interested in it, and that's fine. But leave them a guide, so they'll know what to do with it. Oh, well, mom wanted me to do this. I'm going to do that for her. Dad, you know, this is what he wanted me to do. If you do it now, have it on paper or explain it to them, then they'll know. If you never do or anything about it when you're gone, they're not going to know. They're going to think, well, this is just a bunch of paper. And there it goes. So. And if you leave it for us in archives or something, then future generations will be able to learn from your work. How many of us would love to have had one of our ancestors leave something, anything? <laughs> we would love to have that. And so do your ancestors proud and leave your work for future generations, OK? Um, the last part on this is um, telling the story. We all have the goal of telling our ancestors' story. How we achieve that goal is different for each of us. There are hundreds of ways to tell the story of each of our ancestors individually or as a family. The main thing is that we put the story in a form that will last for generations to come. We want our hard work to outlive us and go on to be a help to others in their quest to seek their family. Um, I put using Ancestry.com to document your ancestors. I was supposed to have a computer in here. I hope I, mean, I can get one. I'm just going to show you an example of mine. Use a computer family tree program. I use Legacy, the free version of Legacy. You can buy a version. There's also Family Tree Maker. Now, this is not necessarily online. It's on your computer. I think you can link maybe to Ancestry. I'm not sure about that because I don't link. Family Tree Maker, yes. does it link? Does it upload it to? No, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how it works. It's synchronizing. It does. Okay. It, what what it, does that mean? I have an old one. You make, once you synchronize They're on both. both trees, Okay. you make a change, it makes it in both of them, regardless of what So if you have a tree on Ancestry, and say you have a Family Tree Maker tree, and they're the same tree, you can synchronize them. Synchronize. So if you put something on Family Tree Maker on your computer, it automatically puts it on your tree on Ancestry? Yes. Ah. Um, yeah, if you have right. Oh, okay. It doesn't automatically do it. No. Just no. if you're when, just on your computer. What you say? Yeah. I usually do a lot of work on Ancestry, and then I'll go from Family Tree and tell it to sync, and then it'll sync right. it off. Okay. Oh, that's I did not know that it could do that. See, I learned something new too. But I guess if you have it open all the time, if you put a record, it will go ahead and do it. Yeah. You've got both open. Oh, now, now wait a minute. Say that out loud. I think I saw on an email that I got that it was thirty percent. Probably Family tree maker? Yeah. Okay. Thirty percent off this month. We got till Friday. <laughs> I use the free legacy. I like it, the free legacy. And I do I do a do a class during the year on these types of programs. I like it because when you put the information in and I haven't seen the new family tree, so it may do this. It does it in like a timeline type deal. It does it chronologically and I really like that for me. Um compiling a manuscript. If you, if that's which way you're going with your family history, is compiling a manuscript. It could be a manuscript of short stories. I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, a 500-page volume book. It can be short stories. 
Um, it could be family histories that you've done on each ancestor compiled into a manuscript. Um, in the archives world, a manuscript collection is a collection of, let's say if I gave them my genealogy, everything. That would be a manuscript collection of Melissa Barker's ancestry. So the manuscript can mean more than one thing. And of course, writing a book. When I first started genealogy, I was going to write a book. That was 25 years ago. I haven't written a book yet. <laughs> I'm still searching. Never mind, I told the story. It's upgrade ancestry. And upgrade. Um, if you do the upgrade. I think my problem is, is not knowing when to stop to write anything. I find, I think I, at that point, and then I find something else, and there I go. I'm on that tangent. So, you know, so maybe I will never write anything, but what I'm going to show you, I can get my daughter in here to put up a computer. While she's doing that, we'll move on to something else. This is, I've come to the conclusion, this is the way, yeah, if you don't mind. You want to set up a computer? Just one, yeah. Um, this is my way that I think I've decided that I'm going to leave my family history partly. Unless ancestry goes under the, you know, is gone and no more, even if I die, I believe this all stays on there. So it's there. So I'll show you when it comes up. Um, while we're, before we're doing that, before pizza time, does anybody have any questions first? Yes, Ms. Deborah. Yeah. Ms. Helen touched on a terminology that I was not familiar with, and maybe some of the other people are not as ignorant for it as I am. A DAR school. Oh, would you explain you know, your DAR school? To me, but I, oh. Other people might be interested in what a DAR sure. school is. Sure. Well, we always have Ms. Helen, and I'm sorry I missed you at the beginning. She usually gives us a little DAR report <laughs> of some sort. Well, so, I'm used to it. She started yes. talking about the school. Uh, we'll yeah, 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 we can be here. Can, well, we, get uh, a, uh, can uh, we get a brief description uh, of yes. the school? Yes, absolutely. Um, one, of the, one of the prime objectives of the DAR is to support education of school children. And so, um, in the DAR have two schools in the country that they um, support very much so. Um, one is in Tomasi, South Carolina, and one's in Grant, Alabama. The Tomasi one is um, it's yeah, it's a residential school, and it's it's um, from elementary and middle school, I think. Whereas uh, Kate Duncan Smith DAR school in Grant, Alabama, where I went to school, is kindergarten through twelfth grade, and um, the, the DAR support those schools. They also support several other schools around uh, Cross Nor, Hindman Settlement School, Hindman Settlement School in Kentucky, um, uh, Berry College in in um, Rome, Georgia, that are supported partially by the DAR. But those two schools, Tavasi and Kate Smith, are full um, DAR schools that are supported by the Daughters of the American Revolution. The the education is has a has a focus on patriotism. Did you have anything to tell us tonight about anything coming up with the DAR? I was just going to say again about um, Constitution Day. That's our big okay. deal. Our okay. big deal, Constitution Day, um, which is uh, September seventeenth. We'll be having a Constitution Day luncheon, and I brought some uh, proclamations. Hmm? proclamations. And we'll have proclamations by. Um, that morning by both the county mayor in Houston County and then we'll go to Humphreys County and have a proclamation by the county mayor in Humphreys County of, um, that it's Constitution Day. And um, anyway, Franklin Roosevelt said, the United States Constitution has proven itself the most marvelously elastic compilation of rules of government ever written. So okay. I thought that was a good thing to say. But anyway, I've got... Um, thing on Constitution Day that you okay. can hand out to everybody. And that's it. And I brought you a little copy of the Constitution For Day. me? Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us come. Well, thank you. Our, thank you. Thank you. My Constitution Day. I like that. Do we have any other questions before we move on to the fun stuff? You may not want to handle this today, but, but uh, you mentioned several times your file system. Yes. I was looking for something other than three ring boxes. Yes. And I just want to ground. Now you okay. indicated something tonight you have, I haven't heard it before. You put your families in there chronologically. Okay. So I can understand sure. that yes. with a straight line. Yes. A direct line. Yes. 
but I'm that fellow that also keeps the uncles and the I do too. I do too. I do too. What do you do with it? Okay. Without losing them? The surname, <laughs> you know, yes. it branches out. Gotcha. Like a tree. Yes, it does. How do you do that in a file system? I, this is my file system. Right. I have a filing cabinet. Right now, I only have one. I need more. It's four drawers, and my top, and I have it separated A through Z. Okay. I think my top drawer is A through L and M through whatever. Okay. All of my surnames are done like I told you. Now, I also anybody that marries into the family, any anybody that has a different surname, they get it's a hanging file cabinet. And I take, you know, put the little tab on your hanging, on what's that called? What are those called? Just hanging files? It's a hanging The little tabs. That's where I put the surnames. Okay? If a lady married a gentleman in my family, and she has, of course, a different surname, her maiden name, she will get a hanging file folder with her surname. And if it only has one file in there and it's her, that's all that's in there. But it's there. When I open my drawer, it's there. That's how I handle that. Yeah, but I mean, anybody who is not of my major surnames, married in, they get a hanging file with their with their name on it, with their surname on it, and I make them a file like I do everybody else, and it goes into that, and it's all alphabetical. What connects her to her husband? On on my file science. on my file folder, I have a um, I have a label maker that's connected to my computer that I can type in a label. On that label, I have the last name of the person, comma, first name, if there's a middle name, born, her date, their date, death, their date, father, the father's name, mother, the mother's name, spouse. I put her spouse. <coughs> now, all this connects with my database on the computer. So, my logic is I go onto my computer, if I'm researching that person, I see them on the computer first, then I go to my file system uh, and I'll pull her file if I'm doing something with her. Do you understand that? Yep. Does that help? It does. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions before we... Okay. As the archivist of the county for the last, I guess for this year that we've been doing this, I've been bringing over original documents from the archives because I'm trying to really hit home with you people, you people, that not everything is on the internet. I know that we all know that, but I still have people tell me, but it's all on the internet. So I'm showing you things that are not on the internet. To show you, you've got to go out to the library, to the archives, to these places and search. Now, stuff is coming on the internet faster and faster every single day. But right now we probably have about 5% of everything in the world that's genealogy related on the internet. Maybe 5%. There's stuff lurking in basements of courthouses and attics and boiler rooms and archives that aren't touched. I have stuff in my archives that is waiting to be processed. When I say processed, I mean someone going through it, cleaning it, unfolding it, doing whatever it needs to indexing it, cataloging it, so that I can tell people, we have this collection, and look, I have an index. You want to check for your surname? But right now, it's all in a box, waiting till I can get to it. And that's how all archives are. So what I brought tonight um, are ledger books. Um, we know all the major categories of records, pretty much. This is a category of records that are not rare. There's a lot of them. But we normally don't really know about them until we just happen to run across them. There is a myth about farmers. Now, I don't have a farmer ledger book in this collection, in the, what I brought, which I did. I always, and I thought of it too, I always thought farmers, if you had a farmer that did, especially didn't own land in your ancestry, that was a dead end. You weren't going to find a whole lot because they were just a farmer. They didn't really do nothing. They were just a farmer. Farmers are, have, have done a lot. And a lot of farmers at certain periods of time kept detailed ledgers of the business of their farm. And I have seen inside these ledgers where they listed family members' births, deaths, along with their calves' births and deaths. <laughs> Um, I know Stewart County has these types of books. 
that have not been indexed and you just don't know what you're going to find in them. So tonight, if you'll clear your spot because we use gloves, because these are our original records, you can put on the floor or just set it aside on the chair. No, uh, if you have drinks, you've got lids, that's good. Thank you. And if you don't have gloves, I can give you gloves and these are for you to keep. They should be one size fits all. They're for you to keep. I you do, you do. If you come back to class, bring them with you. Yes, Brenda. Anybody else back here need gloves? You got yours? Oh, Miss Helen. Miss Barbara, do you need some? No, I'm just. I will address the gloves controversy. In the archives world, there is a gloves controversy, believe it or not. Um, the old school is you wore gloves with everything. Anytime you touched anything, you wore gloves. That's changed now. Um, now, the way it goes, it'll change again in another 10 years. You don't have to wear gloves with what we're fixing to work with or with most documents unless they're fragile. The reason being, you all have your gloves on. Let me see your gloves. Now, pick up a piece of paper and feel the dexterity that you have with the piece of paper. It's difficult to feel what you have. It's difficult to feel if you're tearing something or if it's crumbling underneath your fingers. So now, the rule is you don't need to wear gloves with most documents and records. That way you can feel it with your fingers and you won't damage it further if it's damaged. Now, you do wear gloves with photographs. Any photographs you wear gloves. What are you doing? Her gloves are clean. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. My gloves are a little big on my fingers. But photographs, even your own photographs at home, you have gloves now. Wear gloves when you touch your photograph. Your oils on your hands will degrade your photographs. Actually, probably fairly quickly, the oils stay on the photographs. So I would encourage you. You're going to look funny in front of your family. Say, wait a minute, let me get my gloves before I show you these pictures. But only the pictures. And it's an extremely damaged documents we use gloves. But most of the time we don't. But tonight, we're using gloves just so you can get the effect, mainly. So I'm going to, I can't have enough ledger books to give to everybody, so I'm going to give some 